Exodus chapter 33. I think I already said that. And uh, we're just going to pick up what is a really seminal, a central moment in the life of Israel. And you probably know the story of Exodus pretty well, but uh, at the beginning uh, of Exodus, we have Moses, this figure in Exodus 3, having this really powerful encounter with God at the burning bush. And Moses has, uh, has been born, obviously, and he's fled it, um, Egypt where... Um, God's people, Israel, have been enslaved. And he's fled there because he, was, he basically murdered somebody. He murdered an Egyptian who was uh, persecuting this Israelite. He flees uh, into the desert and he's in the wilderness in Exodus 3 when God meets him powerfully in this burning bush, this bush which is burning but yet not burning up. It's a pretty crazy moment. Not, not, not by the way, the only crazy moment in Exodus or in the scriptures, but a very crazy one. God meets him and says, Moses, what I want you, I've got a job for you to do. And here's the job. I want you to go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And you can almost see God like wink. <laughs> All right, on your way. And Moses is like, whoa, 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 hang on. You've just asked me to do something which is patently ridiculous because I don't know if you know, but I'm a convicted murderer. Or not convicted, I'm on the run. And I don't really want to go back there. And Pharaoh is really, really powerful. And I'm slow of speech. And it doesn't really sound like a good idea. Let's not do that, God. Have you got another plan? And of course, God doesn't have another plan. And God wins. It's got, you know, have you ever had a tug of war with God where he said, do this? And you're like, nuh uh. And then he says, no, do it. And you're like, uh, and he's like, do it, and you, you do it. And so Moses goes back, and, he, and by God's power, by his outstretched hand, God delivers the Israelites from Egypt, you know, the ten plagues, every one of them systematically dismantling the gods uh, of Egypt. And God shows that he is the one true God, and God's people are set free. And in Exodus 15, they arrive in the wilderness on the other side of the Red Sea. I forgot to mention, they go through a sea on dry land. Wow, that happens. And then um, they're on the other side and they, and they just spontaneously erupts this moment of worship in Exodus 15. They worship God for what he's done. And they wander in the wilderness. Eventually they're wandering there for 40 years, but they just begin this journey of wandering in the wilderness. They arrive at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, their leader, Moses, we've met him, uh, trundles up the mountain to meet with God and God gives him the Ten Commandments, the law and some other laws as well. Moses comes down and delivers them to the people, reads them off and, um, and then Moses disappears for a bit longer. And it's, it, it's in the time where he's disappeared where something uh, it just deeply tragic happens for God's people. And what happens is he's been gone away a few weeks and they start to wonder if he's coming back. And in the midst of that really unwillingness to wait for God, impatience, they, um, they engage in this uh, just terrible idolatry. They ask Aaron, who's kind of stand-in leader for Moses while Moses is away. They ask Aaron to make for them a golden calf. Uh, a, a symbol, a picture, a re really a replacement in many ways of God. Uh, an, an idol that they can worship while Moses is away. And in so doing, they break the first three commandments in one fell swoop. Which actually is remarkably efficient if it wasn't so tragic. And, and of course, God is, is deeply, deeply hurt, enraged. Um, and, and Moses goes down the mountain, and as he's wandering down the mountain with the tablets of stone that God has given him, uh, with, the, with the law written on them, he hears the sound of celebration, it seems like, or it turns out it's revelry, that people are engaging really in an orgy. And he goes down the mountain, and as he sees this, he chucks the, uh, the tablets to the floor, and you think, gosh, is he just angry? Is that just kind of him just kind of throwing a strop? No. He, he's, he's, by breaking the tablets, he's demonstrating prophetically that the covenant has been broken by God's people. Uh, just a tragic moment. And, uh, and he goes down and, he, uh, and I, for some reason, when I read this, I always quite like it. I don't know why. It says, maybe it says something about my leadership. But um, he, he, he gets the golden calf, grinds it to dust, puts it in the water and makes them drink it. Something in that just kind of really appeals to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a sick and twisted person. <laughs> So judge as you will. Anyway, and the consequences for that sin are catastrophic for God's people. Many, many of the Israelites die by the sword uh, as a consequence of that. And others die by plague. But there's a third consequence which is far worse uh, than the others. And we begin to see that in Exodus 33. So verse 1. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive up the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. It took some practice that. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people. In other words, you're proud, you're stuck up. And I might destroy you on the way. So here's the third consequence that's, uh, that, that, uh, of, of this sin, of this uh, idolatrous behavior. And God says to them, look, uh, leave this place and go and take possession of the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to the patriarchs. In other words, I'm offering you the promised land. Go forward from here and take the promised land. Plunder it. You're going to have victory there. And you're reading this and you're thinking, well, this is going quite well. As a consequence of sin, we get what you'd always promise God. You know, I mean, what's happening here? So God says, you can have the land that was promised to you on oath. In other words, you may have broken your oath to me, but I'm not about to start breaking mine to you. You can have what I promised you. And even here, even in the midst of sin, we see the faithfulness of God, don't we? That he even, he's going to be faithful to his covenant even when the people haven't been. In other words, you can have the land. And then verse 2, I will send an angel before you. And drive out the Canaanites, etc. You know, I'm going to say it again. Um, I'm going to drive out this people. You can have an angel. In other words, not only will you have victory or the thing that we most want as human beings, not only will you have success, but I'm also going to give you protection. You can have an angel go before you. And he will help you with this task. You'll get success because the angel will help you drive out these nations. And then verse 3, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. Not only you have protection, not only you have victory guaranteed, but also the land is a land of provision. And you're thinking, okay, victory guaranteed, protection, provision. It's the dream, And yet there's something missing. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. See, the consequence, the really damaging consequence for Israel here is not just the fact that uh, they've lost members of Israel, but the really damaging consequence is that there's a possibility here that they might lose God's presence. And the response is absolutely fascinating. Get this with me, verse four. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you're a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. What we have here, guys, happening is a a moment of national mourning. This is this is huge. This is a you know their response, their their innate response. You know they're they're sinners. Clearly, they've done something horrendous. You know, and and they're feeling guilty. But then this happens, and they're like, oh, that this innate response within them is to mourn. These words that God has said, even though they're being offered all this stuff, these words that God has said are to them distressing words. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. Why are they mourning? Is it because they're not going to gain victory? No, we've already heard that they are. Is it because they're going to lack protection? No, we've heard that they will have that. Is it because they're going to starve? No. God has promised that the land will flow with milk and honey. Why are they mourning? Because they get it, that the thing which is most important to their their identity as God's people, the thing which makes them them, the thing that's been important all along, is it's not actually about the land, it's not actually about the provision, it's not actually about the protection, it's about the presence. They understand what it was about all along. It was always about God. You see, it's not about the means. It's about the end, and God's presence is the end. God's presence is is the point 
of the whole thing. And they get it in that moment. Why is his presence so important to them? Well, we kind of get a sense of that as we read on. Verse 7. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. Really what we have here outside the camp is a a, a prayer tent that anyone can go to. Moses regularly would go there. It's a place where God's presence was was manifested. And verse verse 9, as Moses went into the tent, A pillar of cloud, which symbolizes God's presence, would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped. Isn't that interesting? That's the natural response to the presence of God is worship. That's why, by the way, when time and time again through the scriptures, whether it's Abraham, Isaiah, or Isaiah, you know, in, in that vision that he has in the temple, what happens when people enter the presence of God is they get on their faces. Because God's presence, naturally we worship, and that's what happens here. They all sudden worship, each at the entrance to their tent. I love this line. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Isn't that a great picture of, of intimacy? You know, when you're face to face with somebody, what, what, does it, I mean, what does it mean? I mean, it, unless you're really angry, you know, somebody's... We don't do road rage here at Jesus Church, but you know people that have road rage, don't you? You know others who have experienced road rage, friends of yours, distant relatives who have experienced road rage. You know, and you know that you get some, get in, getting in somebody's face, I think that's an American phrase, is it? Is that an American phrase? Uh, no? Yes. yes. Okay, good. You know, you know what that means. But actually, really, we know that to, to, be, to be in somebody's face, to be face-to-face is, is what intimacy is, isn't it? Every so often, my wife will allow me to kiss her. <laughs> and, and sometimes I blow her kisses, but sometimes she allows me to, to kiss her on the face. And obviously that means being face to face with her. There's a picture there of intimacy. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Wow. Wow. And by the way, what, what an amazing picture. You know Joshua's the next leader of Israel. He's the one that takes them into the promised land. What an amazing picture of what preparation for a, for a leader is. You know, some of you folks, you're in leadership here. Um, you, know, you lead a missional community. You're, um, you serve on one of the teams here that you know, just make this place tick. Or whatever it is you're doing, you may be on the prayer team. You want to get on the prayer team here. I encourage you to do that. Come to one of the trainings that the guys are running here. You know, you want to know how to prepare to be a leader? There it is. Get in God's presence. That's what Joshua does. That's what makes him the next leader of Israel. Anyway, the point here is that what Moses and Joshua have experienced is intimacy with God. The goal uh, and the thing I think that Israel is so afraid of losing is this sense of God's intimate presence. His intimate presence. His, his close face-to-face presence. And I think that's why they mourn. And not only that, but we see that they're also afraid of losing God's presence for another reason. And in verse 12, we read, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, I love this, remember that this nation is your people. You know, it's like, just please, God, remember, remember that this nation is your people. Verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. But the you there is singular. God is saying at this point, Moses, I'll go with you. You haven't displeased me. Remember, you were at the, mount, you were at the mountain with me. I, you've got an alibi, Moses. The rest of them, though, I'm done. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us. You see, interceding again, what a leader. Interceding for the people. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And here's what's really fascinating. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face 
of all the earth. Then Moses has a really powerful encounter with God. So not only is God's presence the the means through which we have and and God's people have intimacy with him, and to lose his presence is to lose the sense of of his intimate presence with them, but also God's presence is what makes God's people Israel, and in fact what makes us distinct. Do you know that? That aside from and apart from the presence of God amongst us, I don't just mean amongst us when we're here gathering a Sunday morning, although, you know, praise God that he's here right now. He's, and let me say that again. God is actually here. Isn't that good news? And that means for the person here who is, who is uh, looking to find faith, you've come to the right place. It means that for for the person who is asking questions about God, you've come to the right place. God is here, and it's our prayer, our belief that God's going to meet with many of us this morning and reveal himself. But God's people are are made distinct. We're made distinct. What makes us who we are is God's presence. You know, and and we can we can so easily be distracted from that reality. You know, we can get so kind of caught up in all the other things, the the kind of the surface level stuff of church, the surface level stuff of the Christian life, and we say, "Gosh, you know, I really love this church because the coffee is just wonderful, and I just happen to love Stumptown coffee, and that's what they serve here, and it's just fantastic, isn't it? Wonderful, and you know, praise Jesus that the coffee is so wonderful in Portland. It really is. It's miserable in England." So thank I mean it's one of the main reasons I'm here honestly this morning is the coffee. Not true. <laughs> thank you that the coffee is so wonderful. And you know actually it just so happens that the worship is wonderful too and I love Evan he's just so good looking and the way he sings and oh goodness me I mean it's just wonderful. I love being here for the worship and and the website. Have you seen the website and don't get me started on John Mark. I mean he's just fantastic. And all that other stuff we can get caught up in that and that stuff's great isn't it? It's great. I love it. I love all of it. But it's not really what makes us, us. Because you can get all that stuff in some of the form somewhere else. The only thing you cannot have anywhere else other than the church, God's people gathered and scattered, is the presence of God. The Holy Spirit. He has a name. His name is the Holy Spirit. And he is the gift. He's the gift. He is the gift given to Jesus' people. And he is wonderful. He is wonderful. A.W. Tozer, who was, a, who was a, an American, I think he died in the last century. I would say just a really powerful prophetic voice. Uh, he said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, again, remember he's writing a long time. He wasn't writing about a Jesus church in Portland, by the way. But he said, uh, if the Holy, church was withdrawn from the church, Holy Spirit sorry, was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Would we know the difference? Would you know the difference? Would I know the difference if God withdrew his presence from my life? What would happen? Have I, have I structured my life so completely around the presence of God that without his presence with me, it would fall apart? It's a really challenging question. <laughs> it's one that keeps me awake at night. But you see, the great truth, the great promise of the Christian faith is that God has freely, freely, because of the work of Jesus, freely poured out his presence, freely poured out his presence upon his people. And here's the great thing. He continually wants to pour his presence out again and again and again on his people. And what, what he's looking for is a people who will say yes. And the, the, the mind-blowing truth at the heart of the Christian faith is that what Jesus has done isn't the end of the story. That after that, we get to participate in in the divine nature, as it says in 1 Peter, through the Holy Spirit, that God himself, the creator God, the redeemer God, uh, through his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Christ, as it's uh, mentioned in in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit isn't just among us in some kind of abstract, floaty, cloud like way. 
but he's come to live in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that, let me tell you, makes all the difference. So how can we be the people, be a people who, met, who can ensure, how do we ensure that we are prioritizing God's presence, that we are doing everything we can to live lives saturated in his presence? Well, of course, the answer, as any, anyone who's ever attended Sunday school knows, is Jesus We see in Jesus the model of what a human life looks like, submitted, fully saturated by and to the presence of God. And so I just want to look at a couple things before we close and pray together that we can learn from the life of Jesus. And the first one, I just want to look at Luke chapter 2, verse 41. So if you turn there, if you would be so good. And there's that picture. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But there's a picture uh, from Jesus' early life. And what happens is that he and his parents and a group of presumably the village, I don't know, set out to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Funnily enough, to celebrate the event uh, whereby God delivered Israel from Egypt. So they're there to celebrate it in Jerusalem. They didn't live in Jerusalem, but they kind of make the journey. It's a two-day journey. And after after the festival is over... They're on their way back and Jesus' parents and whoever else, but Jesus' parents just assume that he's with them. I guess they're traveling like as a a wider family. It's kind of a communal vibe. You know, they don't all travel in their kind of, you know, cars, their air-conditioned cars with nobody out, nobody else in them. They're just walking together and they assume Jesus is there. Well, he was there at the temple. Surely he's going to be following us. And and it's a couple days, I think, which is really worrying. Um, Yeah. It's a couple of days before, it's certainly a while before they even figure out he's not there. And so they go back to Jerusalem and um, smack on the, the wrist there for Mary and Joseph. And, uh, and they return and they find him in the temple. And Jesus says this in, in verse 49. Oh, it's actually, in fact, you should listen to this from Mary, verse 48. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? And you can imagine she was even more vexed than that. Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Um, Why were you searching for me? He asked. Duh. I think that's like between the lines is that duh. Why why were you searching for me? I mean, you know, I'm 12. I'm, you know, capable. Didn't you know, he says, didn't you know I had to be, had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Why Why did Jesus have to be in his father's house? Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, we see in the text, you read back, uh, that, that he's learning. He's engaging and, and he's extending his learning by engaging with the rabbis who are astonished by him. But I think there's something even more basic going on there. See, the Jews believed that uh, the temple was the place where heaven met earth. God's reality, heaven and earth, our reality interlocked there and God's presence was literally there. So, so literally there that if you went into the wrong part of the temple at the wrong part of the year, you could die. God's presence was there. So Jesus is saying, didn't you know I'd be here with my father, amongst my father's presence? And what do we see here from Jesus? Well, firstly, what we see is really atypical behavior for a 12-year-old. Let's be honest. You know, and I know Jesus didn't have an Xbox and whatever else. He didn't have the same distractions. But this is somebody who is you're uncommonly hungry for God. And I think just that there's such a, an important picture here. You know, we want to be the sort of people who see God, God's presence moving among us. Yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was normal for us to talk about on Sunday the stuff that God did that could only be described or could only have happened because he did it? Like if that was the norm, you know, if, we, if, we, if it was normal for us to say, hey, you know, wasn't that wonderful when, you know, such and such got healed and wasn't that wonderful to see, and I know this is happening already, wasn't it wonderful to see, isn't it wonderful to have baptized so many people recently, isn't it, and this is happening in this church already, we want more though, we want more of this and Jesus shows us that hunger is right at the heart of it. Let me tell you this, what, one of the things Emily and I were talking about this morning, we have, we have been blown away by the hunger in this church, the hunger for God. It is so encouraging to see. And I just want, I want, to, I want God to stoke that fire. I want people not to be hungry in this place for God, but ravenous. Like, so, so much so that you just don't know what to do with it. You're just hunger and thirsting for righteousness. 
Because it's those people who were healed. And it's not just Jesus, is it? You know, look at Moses and Joshua hanging out in the, in the prayer tent. You know, they probably had other stuff to do. They had the crossword and the Sudoku and whatever it else. Maybe there was Super Bowl on TV or whatever. But no, they weren't there. They were, out, they were out by the tent of meeting. They were hungry to meet with God. Because here's the thing. When you really experience God's presence, even the Super Bowl doesn't seem as quite as exciting. And I know that's a big statement here as we're coming up into February, but, you know, God's presence is really, really fun. And it's not just those guys. I love King David. I love Psalm 27. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 4, David says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. This only do I seek. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Sound familiar? Sound like Jesus as a boy? Look, I don't think David here is like one of those kind of, dare I say it, like a church maniac, like somebody who wants to spend all his time in church and like is is useless really on the outside because he's just at every church. That's not what's happening here. He's just, his, his hunger is for God. And then uh, I love, if we skip ahead, just to um, verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Isn't that wonderful? My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord. Moses saw him face to face. Your face, Lord. Do I, I've been praying that prayer. God, let me see your face. Your face do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. What a wonderful prayer. One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Guys, this is what it's about. This is what the Christian life is about. To be in his presence, to understand his favor, to to understand his presence walking with us. And it comes, I think it's birthed in this place of hunger. There's a Danish philosopher called Soren Kierkegaard. And he said, he he had a book actually, which I have on my bookshelf and have never read. And uh, the title of the book is this. Purity of heart is to will one thing. Purity of heart, to be pure in, pure in heart, is to will one thing. One thing I ask of you, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What's your one thing? What is your one thing? What one thing do you seek? Is it that you may dwell in the house of the Lord? If I'm honest, I I don't have one thing. I've got lots of things. And sometimes my things are a lot more like success, protection. And here's the big one, isn't it, for us? This is our big idol. Comfort. Comfort. And so we live, and we're, we're just, as we get older, trying to create these just more and more comfortable cocoons, you know, so that, and actually, I don't think comfort is the place where we meet with God. I think actually it's often desperation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they'll be filled. It says in Luke chapter 153, he's filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he has sent away empty. There's a, there's a desperation that needs to come forth. And I pray by God's spirit, this morning he would birth the desperation for his presence in this place, in each of us. I pray, I pray birth it in me because heck, I need it. But hunger is the soil in which uh, uh, God's presence just finds growth. And I love what St. Augustine said. He said, put salt, God put salt on my lips that I might thirst for you. So hunger for what? One more thing before we pray. I just want to look at what the hunger is for. I think the hunger is obviously to see God face to face. Or in other words, we would say the hunger is to meet with God. We need to develop a hunger to meet with the living God. And I think we see this in Jesus' life, this hunger for encounter, if you will. Hunger for encounter. And really, if you look at his baptism, I'm looking at Mark chapter 1 here. You can turn there with me. I know you've been studying Mark, so you're familiar with this text. But I think what we see in Jesus' life is just a hunger to meet with the living God, a hunger for encounter. And, um, and I love the text in Mark 1, verse 9. It says, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, 
and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Okay, so we know baptism, you know that Greek word means to be immersed, to be plunged, to be submerged. So physically that's happening for Jesus. He's being submerged into water. Um, that's what's happening to him. He's, he's, physically, that's, that's the moment. It's a moment of surrender. It's a moment of, but it's also for Jesus a moment of, of submersion into something else, into someone else. And that someone else here is the Spirit is the presence of God. Jesus is being submerged and immersed into God's presence. And so it says, verse 10, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. And that's an allusion to Isaiah 64, verse 1. Isaiah, sorry, 64, verse 1, where it says, Oh God, that you would rend open, tear open, rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. In other words, God, that you would appear, that you would come to us, that you would be present among us. And that, Mark's saying, look, that's what happened at Jesus' baptism. God the Father, God the Spirit descended upon God the Son, and we heard a voice, and the voice was the voice of the Father. Verse 11, a voice came from heaven, you are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You know, what's so fascinating about this moment, I I feel, is that it is a moment, clearly for Jesus, of encounter with God. And you say, gosh, well, Jesus doesn't need that. He's, you know, existed, you know, eternally before the creation of the universe, you know, with God. He's been in the presence of God. Does he need it? He doesn't need a kickstart. I mean, Jesus, give me some of that. You know, you can do without it. But yet, no, it seems really clear Jesus does need this. He's human. He needs this encounter with God. And if Jesus needs to encounter God, to meet with him face to face, then so do we. So do we. You know, it is not possible to live the Christian life without a regular sense of meeting with God. And how do I know? Because I've tried it. I've tried to live the Christian life in, in, in terms of performance, in terms of kind of spiritual performance, trying to impress God and you know, make sure that all my actions were perfect. And it just leads to burnout. And I know that because I've burned out and I'm 30 and I've already done it probably a couple of times. To take it from me, what we need as Christians is to be indwelt and continually indwelt, continually be encountering the person of Jesus through the Spirit. We need that. It's not possible to live the Christian life without it. And there are many of us, um, there are many of us who are here this morning and we're just dry and barren and desperate. We'd feel distant from God, maybe. And I think sometimes that's because that's our spirit saying to us, take a drink. (laughs) You need to drink something. We need to listen to that. And this morning, my prayer is that God is going to pour himself out upon us. So what we see here in this powerful encounter with Jesus is two things. He is given the two things he needs for his mission. And this is at the beginning, this is really a commissioning moment for Jesus. What are they? Firstly, he is given power. He's given power to do the stuff that God has him to do. The Spirit is anointing him and it's powerful. And, it, and that power propels him forward. And secondly, he is reminded and clearly, what's clearly stated to him is his identity in God. You are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. In this powerful encounter, Jesus is set up for the life that God has for him to lead. And it isn't easy, remember. It isn't easy. But this identity piece is central And church, we need to hear these words too. And these words of affirmation from the Father come for us too by the Holy Spirit. And it's not possible again to live the Christian life without having that key point in place. That sense of knowing, or it's certainly not easy, without that sense of knowing that God is Father. You know, Jesus only prays one prayer where he doesn't address God as Father. That's when he's on the cross and he quotes Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other prayer is addressed to God, and this is a revolutionary thing for him. We need our identity in place, and we need the power. But it's not just the massive one-off burning bush moments. It's not just the baptism moments, and because it's not just those for Jesus. In chapter 1 of Mark, verse 35, we read this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, which is about 8.30 here in Portland, I've I've realized... Uh, and about 4 p.m. in London. 
Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. It's not all fireworks. It's not all, you know, big noises and all that stuff. That's not, that's not what, an encounter with God isn't just that. Now, you know, gosh, I like the idea of that. I've been praying for one of those for a while. But actually, it's the bread and butter, isn't it? It's sitting before his feet every day and saying, maybe the first thing you do in the morning is you lie in your bed is just to say, I'm here. I know I'm, I'm your child. Can you fill me again today? Can I, can I know your presence right now, Jesus, says, before I even get up? <laughs> Rather than checking your Twitter feed, which is what I do most of the time. It's just, it's, it's the simple stuff, guys, but it all contributes. If it comes from a place of hunger, it all contributes to a sense of God's presence with us as we go. Church, what do we need? We need to live life in God's presence because we need power and we need to know his identity. We need to experience intimacy with him. And I want to pray for that uh, for us and with us. So would you stand with me? Would you stand? And... Um, and I'm a guest, and you guys are so kind and generous. So, I, so if you do this, I don't know if you do this regularly, but just, just please come with me on this little, little British venture that we're going on here. And what I just want to do is just create some space together, because honestly, you've heard enough of me now, more than enough. Uh, and I think it'd just be really fun just to pray together and just create space for God to be God and God to meet with us. Okay? And so all that's going to look like is, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to uh, just be ready to pray and to receive. And the way we do it in Britain um, is just to stand there like this. That's it. And it's not magic, um, but sometimes the posture of our bodies displays what's happening on the inside. So, I mean, you would understand, right, if somebody's standing like that, that's kind of saying something, right? That's kind of saying Steer well clear, please. And so, if you, similarly, if you're standing like this, you're saying, look, I'm open. So you don't have to do that. Um, but if you would, then that's fine. You might want to shut your eyes. I, I just find it easier to concentrate. I'm sure it'll be dark anyway. But if you, you might want to shut your eyes. Um, and I'm just going to pray. And then here's what we're going to do. We're just going to wait. It's going to be really quiet. Uh, you don't need to feel awkward. I'm the one that should feel awkward. Um, and I won't be because I'm used to this now, which is going to be really quiet, and we're just going to wait together. And your job, and this is the only thing you have to do, it's to do nothing. Just receive. Just be ready to receive. Don't, don't start praying for yourself. Don't start, you know, repenting of every, you know, thing you may have done in the last 50 years or whatever. I mean, if something comes to mind, then just mention it to God and just leave it. Just receive. That's it. And I'll coach you the rest. Sound good? Great. Okay. Uh, if you want to assume the position. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And um, we know that, Holy Spirit, it's by you that we cry out, Abba, Father. Um, Holy Spirit, we're, we're really hungry to have the same relationship to experience for ourselves the same relationship with you that Jesus did. And actually, we believe that that's our inheritance. That's actually why Jesus did the stuff he did and said the stuff he said. And so, Holy Spirit, we're just asking you, would you reveal Jesus to us so that Jesus might take us into the arms of Abba, of the Father? Holy Spirit, come. Would you fall upon us, we pray. We welcome you, we love you. Come Holy Spirit.